what we got to last week was some issues with routing algorithms and routing techniques. What are some of the problems or, or decisions we need to make when we des design an algorithm for routing? That is some way to find a path from source to destination. Then we need to choose the criteria for selecting the best path. So what do we mean by best? And there are different criteria, sometimes called metrics. So four of them are listed here. There are others. So these are our performance criteria or routing metrics, ways to measure the best path. When to decide which route to take, who decides, who, who collects the information, whether it's all nodes participate in a distributed manner or there's some special centralized node that collects information. And then the last two parts which we're going to spend a bit more time on is where do we get information from and how often do we collect that information? But first, let's, let's just look at route, routing metrics and look at another simple example. You don't have this one. Here's a network with five nodes, five switches. And if we want to choose a path from node one to node four, We've got two possible paths in this case. Path 1, 2, 3, 4 and path 1, 5, 4. So source, node 1, destination 4. And the links, I've given some characteristics of each of the links. For example, the link from node 1 to 2 has a delay, for example, propagation delay, maybe queuing delay at the nodes of 5 milliseconds and a data rate of 100 megabits per second. And similar, we've got values for other links. So, in this, in this simple network, if we want to get from node 1 to node 4, what's the, the least cost path if we use the metric of hops? Can anyone tell me? What is the least cost path if we use the metric of hops? And a reminder, what is a hop? A hop is the traversal of one link. We make one hop from one node to another. And in routing, we normally find the least cost path, where the cost is determined by our metric. So what's the path? One, five, four. Okay, two hops. A hop from one to five, and a hop from five to four. So two hops across that path. If we took the other path, it's three hops. So when we use hops as a metric, then the costs we can think of each link is one. That is, the, the cost for this link is one, the cost, cost for the link from five to four is one, the cost for all links is one. And in least cost routing, what, what, once we have the costs for the links, we simply find the path with the least cost, where the cost of the path is the sum of the cost of the links on that path. So the cost of this path is 2, the cost of this path is, path is 3, therefore the least cost path, or the least cost route is 154. That's using the metric of hops. Path 154, cost 2 units, 2 hops. <coughs> what if we use delay instead of hops as the metric? We change the metric to delay. What is the path and what is the cost of that path? And you've got two, two choices of path, so not so hard, but what's the total cost? What's the best path now? Which path are you going to take? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Why? least number of the total delay. If you add up these three delays, 5 milliseconds plus 6 milliseconds plus 10 milliseconds, then we have 21 milliseconds from 1, 2, 3, 4. The alternate path takes us 28 milliseconds. So in that case, if we use a different metric, we would say the least cost path would be 1, 2, 3, 4. <coughs> so the costs in this case 
come directly from the delay. In fact, so if we know the delay of the link, we can say the cost of this link is 5. So we get a different least cost path. 1, 2, 3, 4, total cost of 21. So with those two cases, hops or delay, we can relate the metric to the cost and then just use an algorithm like, all right, we can calculate it manually, but for a larger network, network we could use an algorithm like Dijkstra's algorithm that would calculate that for us, because that's how the, those sh shortest path uh, algorithms, uh, how they work. They use the cost to determine the shortest path from source to destination. Any questions? Those two are easy. This one's not so easy. Least cost path from node 1 to node 4 if the metric is data rate. <coughs> and the way to think of that, I want to get a lot of data from node 1 to node 4. I've got a network and I'm going to run it for uh, months and I'm always sending data across that network. If we care about the, the data rate, or eventually the throughput, which is proportional to the data rate, which path should we use to get the highest data rate? Which one? One, two, three, four. Why? High data rate. This one. So in the path one, two, three, four, the first link has a data rate of 100 megabits per second, which means we've got a lot of data. Let's say across a period of uh, 24 hours, one day, we've always got data to send. So we can send it at 100 million bits per second to node 2. When that receives data, it's, it's continuously receiving data, we're always sending. It receives data and sends to node 3 that data at 10 megabits per second. And as 3 receives data, it sends at a rate of 50 megabits per second to 4. And let's look at that in a bit more depth. If, if node 1 is sending at 100 megabits per second, at what speed does node 2 receive? What's the maximum speed it can receive? Assuming no errors, nothing goes wrong, at what rate does it receive data? No overheads, everything's simple. If 1 sends at 100 megabits per second, 2 receives at 100 megabits per second. Okay, easy you receive at the same rate you uh, the, the sender is sending on the link. So 2 is receiving data at 100 megabits per second. 2 is sending data at 10 megabits per second. It cannot send faster. At what speed does node 3 receive the data? 10 megabits per second. Node 3 is receiving data at 10 megabits per second. Now across those two links, even though we're sending or we could potentially send at 100 megabits per second here, node 3 is never going to receive at a rate larger than 10 megabits per second. It cannot receive at 100 megabits per second because this link here limits our speed. Now, although node 3 can send at 50 megabits per second to node 4, Node 3 is only receiving at 10 megabits per second. It's like I'm receiving data 10 megabits per second. How fast can I send out data on average? On average, I cannot send any more than 10 megabits per second because I'm only, I've only got 10 megabits per second to receive. All right, I can send out at 50 megabits per second, but then I'd spend some time not sending at all. The data that we send out cannot not be larger than the data that we send in over a long period of time. So what would actually happen at node 3 is it receives data at 10 megabits per second, it transmits that quickly, and then it waits to receive some more data, not sending anything. And then it receives some more and transmits. So we care about the, the speed at which we can deliver data from node 1 to node 4. And across this path, we are limited by this link. If we look over a long period of time and measure it, then 
even though we can send it 100 here and 50 here, in fact, across the entire path, the best we could do from 1 to 4 is limited by 10 megabits per second. Uh, now, do you want to revise your answer? What's the best path? 154. Across that path, the best we could do is at 20 megabits per second because the, what we say the bottleneck link is the link with the lowest data rate. So in path 1, 2, 3, 4, the bottleneck link has a capacity or data rate of 10 megabits per second. In 154, 20 megabits per second, which is better. So the better path in that case would be 154. Uh, if you don't understand why that limits us, have a think about it and maybe you can do some calculations of transmission times or think about other things you may know like water flow through pipes. The amount that you can send through a pipe of a certain diameter uh, is limited, the rate at which the water flows. This is like pipes, we have a very thick pipe here, we can send a lot of data, but once it gets here, uh, we've got a thin pipe, the, we're restricted as to how much water can go between two and three. And even though we have a thicker pipe here, the amount coming into that pipe is limited by what comes into node three. So in fact, we're limited by the, the lowest capacity link in this case, or the lowest capacity pipe in a water system. Often called the bottleneck link. It's the slowest part of the network. So, best path we just determined is 154. How would we calculate that? That is, what we need to do with least cost routing is assign costs to the links such that an algorithm like Dijkstra's algorithm can automatically find the path by simply finding the path with the least cost when we add up the costs. One way to do that is to consider, okay, our network has a maximum data rate of all the links of 100 megabits per second. We know the actual data rates of the links. Let's assign a cost to each link, which is the maximum divided by the actual. So we get these cost values. This link from 1 to 2 has a cost of 1 unit. 100 megabits per second divided by... So the maximum divided by the actual of 100 megabits per second. The second link has a cost of 10. 100 divided by 10, and so on. These are the costs we assign. And now we just use an algorithm to find the path with the least cost. 1, 2, 3, 4 has a cost of 13. 1, 5, 4 has a cost of 10. Least cost path, 10, 1, 5, 4. So sometimes with our metrics, we cannot equate the metric value to the cost. We could with delay. Cost of this uh, path uh, this link was five units because delay is additive across the, the the path delay is just the sum of the link delays but data rate is not additive so we need some function to, to convert the data rate into some cost so it's a bit more complex there in fact that function doesn't work in all cases it works in many practical cases but not, not in all cases so just an example of least cost routing we take some metric, use that metric to assign a cost to each link. Once we have costs on links, then we use some algorithm to find the least cost path from source to destination. Sometimes that, the mapping of cost to, uh, metric to cost is, is more complex than what we have seen in simple cases. So let's return to the case in our network. We calculate the least cost paths at some point in time, but over time the network conditions may change. Therefore, we need to collect information about the network conditions. Where do we collect that from? How do we collect it? And we often need to update that information on a regular basis. How often do we update it? So we're going to look at some, some examples of where do we get information from and how often do we update that information. Here's our example network. 
remind, uh, a reminder, <coughs> the least cost path from node 1 to node 6 was 1456. We calculated last lecture. 1 plus 1 plus 2, a cost of 4. So let's say node 1 has calculated least cost path from 1 to 6 is 1546. Cost is 4 units. It's sending its data across that path. Node 1 has a lot of data to send to 6. It's sending it across this path, 1, 4, 5, 6, and keeps sending. Because maybe when we built the network, we told Node 1, these are the links, these are the costs, and we ran some algorithm here that calculated the least cost path to 6. So we're using that path. But over time, the conditions of the network may change. So let's say the link from node 5 to 6, the conditions change. And the cost was, five, was 2 units before. And let's say the cost rises to 20. Why? Well, it depends on what the cost is measuring. Maybe the cost is related to the amount of uh, congestion or, or data going across that link. And it, at some point, it's going up, meaning this link is becoming worse and worse for our data transfer. As the cost goes up, that's bad. So the, the cost goes up. Now, node 1 is still sending data to node 6 via this path 1456. Is it using the optimal path? Is node 1 using the optimal path to get data from 1 to 6? Hands up for yes. Hands up for no. OK, a few people. All right, you, you can check. The path from 1 to 6 has now has a cost of 1 plus 1 plus 20, 22. I'm sure you can find other paths to, from 1 to 6 with a lower cost. For example, 1, 3, 6 has a cost of 5 plus 5, 10 units. So it's no longer using the least cost path. It's using a suboptimal path if it keeps using 1456, which is bad. Bad for performance because what we want with routing is to use the best path, the least cost path. We're not using it anymore because the network conditions changed. So, what we'd like is that somehow Node 1 learns of this change. So it will update and recalculate the least cost path and find an alternate path to Node 6. So it avoids this 20 cost link here. Well, how does it know that this link cost has changed from 2 to 20? Remember these, uh, uh, this may be a network across a, a country or a city. There's uh, no direct link from node 1 to node 5 or 6. So what information does node 1 know? Well first, each node we assume knows about the costs and the the endpoints of each of its links. That is, its connections to its neighbours. Node 1 knows that it is linked to Node 4, and the cost of the link to Node 4 is 1, and reverse is 7. When we see these arrows here, think that there's three cables plugged into Node 1. When we turned on Node 1, we knew who was at the other endpoint of those cables, and we know the costs of using those links. So we say that each node knows information which is local to itself. Information source local meaning information that that node has immediately or always has access to. So we assume node 1 knows about these links and the cost of those links. So if anything changes on those links, for example, the link to, from node 1 to node 4 changes from 1 to 10, node 1 knows about that immediately. Okay, that's easy. So if it did change here, node 1 could recalculate. Unfortunately, this hasn't changed. The link over here has changed. Node 1 does not have direct access to that information. It's a link to some other node. So. Each node knows information about its local links, or its links to neighbours. We have three neighbours of node 1. Another way to learn about the changes in the network is to ask your neighbours to tell you about their links. So what we could do is say, every node 
tells its neighbour about the current conditions. For example, Node 4 sends a message to Node 1 saying, I currently have links to 1, 2, 3 and 5 and the costs of those links are these values. And similar, Node 2 sends a message to Node 1 saying, I currently have links to these nodes, these are my neighbours and these are the cost of the links. In that way, Node 1 would learn about the current conditions of those other links. And try and draw what Node 1 knows, considering different information. So Node 1 knows about its local links. So when I highlight it red, it means Node 1 knows that information. That is, who, who is on the other end point of the link and what's the cost of that link? And similar, the link up to node 3. And reverse. Those links we say are local information or uh, are local to node 1. If we extend and we get our neighbours to tell us about their links, so node 3, node 2 and node 4 all send some special message to node 1, then node 1 would eventually know about its neighbours links, which includes all these other links, node 2 to 3, uh, the reverse direction, so node 1 would learn about the links and the costs of its neighbours links. Who is at the other end point and what are the, sorry, who, and what are the costs? So that is using information from what we say adjacent nodes or neighbour nodes. The neighbour nodes inform us. From node 1, node 1's perspective that is better because now node 1 has a better picture of the current conditions of the network. It knows about the costs of all of these red links. So it knows more than just its local information. It knows most of the network in this case, in this example. In a larger network, uh, maybe not. Now the problem with this approach of asking your neighbours to tell you about your, about their links, is it creates some overhead in communications. That is, we need to send a special message from node 1, oh sorry, node 4 to node 1, and node 2 to node 1, and node 3 to node 1. We say that's an overhead of using the network. We want to minimise that. We don't, we want, we'd like to avoid that overhead, because spend, sending that special message is time that we cannot spend sending data. So the advantage of asking our neighbours to tell us about their links is that we learn more about the network, but the disadvantage is that we have some overhead. And of course, not just do these three nodes have to tell their neighbours, all nodes have to tell their neighbours. Unfortunately, just by asking our neighbours, we still don't know about this link from 5 to 6 because we were unlucky in that none of our neighbours have a link between have the link from 5 to 6. So what can we do? Well, we could extend and ask our neighbours' neighbours to tell us about their links. We'd learn more about the network, but there would be more messages sent through the network, more overhead. And the best case, ask all nodes to tell us about their links. So every node in the network sends a message to node 1 about their current status of the links. And if 6 sent a message to 1, and as would 5, then node 1 would learn about that link and would learn that the link from 5 to 6 ha now has a cost of 20. OK, let's update my least cost routes and let's find a new route from 1 to 6. So where do we get information from? The case of none will, is a special case. We'll return to that later. Local, meaning information that's local to that current node. Ask our neighbour or adjacent nodes 
Uh, and the, maybe the, the best case is all nodes. Ask all nodes or get all nodes to tell us about their current links. Uh, nodes along some route, uh, again, a special case we may see later. Once node 1 knows that this link has changed to 20, we recalculate the route and start using that optimal route. So we recalculate the route, find the best one, whatever it is, and then one minute later, the cost changes back to 1. What happens? What do we do? Do we know that the cost has changed? We don't know. How could we know? We need some, some regular updates of the cost. That is, we need to repeat this procedure of getting all nodes to tell us about their costs. So in general, we need to keep learning about the costs and the topology changes. That is, we need to get updates. When do we get updates? Continuous means we always have access to the information. For example, we would say that the local links for node 1, if this cost changes from 1 to 2, then node 1 immediately knows that, because it's directly connected to that link. So we'd get continuous updates about that cost. That's easy. Another approach is periodic updates. Every five minutes, each node sends a message to every other node saying these are the current costs. So we get an update every five minutes on a periodic basis. Or maybe there's a major change in the amount of data traveling through a, uh, the network or a portion of the network, a major load change. That is. The amount of data traveling between 5 and 6 suddenly jumps to be very high. That triggers node 5 to tell everyone, uh, this link is being used a lot. Maybe you want to update your routes. So a major change in how the network's being used. Or a topology change. The link from 5 to 6 goes down. It's disconnected. It's no longer there in our network. Then maybe that triggers node 5 to tell everyone, I no longer have a link to 6. Please update your routes if necessary. So there are different ways to trigger when to perform updates based upon some events or on a periodic basis. Because as the network operates, we'd like to use the least cost routes. And because the network conditions change, we need to get more information about the network to calculate the least cost routes. So there are some trade-offs there. In general, what we can say about where do we get the information from, the source, and how often, the more information we collect, the better the chance we would choose the optimal routes. So the more we know about the network, the more chance we'll choose the best path from source to destination. If I know nothing about the change in the network, if node 1 didn't know that this cost changed from 2 to 20, then of course there's a high chance that node 1 will use the least or a suboptimal route from 1 to 6. The more information we learn, the better chance we'll choose the best path. And the more frequently we learn about the changes, again, the more chance that we'll choose the best path or use the best path for the longest period of time. So learning more information on a regular basis or on a frequent basis is better for choosing best paths. But it's bad for overhead because usually to learn that information nodes need to send special packets through the network if I need to send a special packet to every other node every one second node 4 to every other node and every other node to every other node then there are many packets being sent per second just to learn this information if we extend that to a network of a hundred nodes then we're sending 10,000 packets per second just to inform everyone about the network conditions. Not to send data, but to learn about the network conditions. So, the more information, the better for choosing the best route, but the worse it is for overhead. So that's the main trade-off with routing, or this part of routing.
any questions on those issues for the routing techniques? Let's look at some other parts of routing. Assuming that we can learn the information about the network topology, and assuming we've got some algorithm for calculating the least cost paths, then what do we do? How do we get the data from source to destination? Well, there are different strategies. Fixed routing is quite simple but we'll use it to introduce some important concepts we use in, in most computer networks. The approach in fixed routing is that we build the network and the person who builds the network knows the network topology. We know who's linked to who and we know the costs of those links because we chose the metric, the performance criteria. So when we build the network, we get a picture of the network like, like this we plug the network parameters into some algorithm, into a computer program that calculates all the least cost paths. Calculates the least cost paths from every source to every destination. So the routes are determined, for example, using Dijkstra algorithm or others. And then we fix that route for the duration of the network, or at least for a long time. So we build the network, calculate the routes, and those routes are fixed, we get fixed routing. At least until there's some major change in the network. Let's say I build the network, it has six nodes, in a month's time I add one more node to it, so maybe at that time I recalculate the least cost routes. But during that one month, the same routes are used all the time. That's easy, because we don't need to learn about the network conditions in the network as it operates. But the problem is that as the network conditions change inside the network, for example, the amount of data being sent across links change, the delays change, with fixed routing we don't choose new routes even as those conditions change. So, for example, if we have some overload, too much data being sent in one portion of the network, we maybe had an overload in the link from node 5 to node 6, a lot of data being sent, the cost went up, with fixed routing, we wouldn't consider that. We'd still keep using this link from node 1, or the path, node 1 through to node 6, until there was some major update in the network, like we add a new node. Then we may recalculate and find, OK, there's a better path from 1 to 6. So normally with fixed routing, we calculate the least cost paths at the start, and then keep them fixed. It's simple, you just calculate the routes at the start and maybe program it either into the nodes themselves or have some special computer that, that stores those routes. When we want to send data, we just look up the route and send the data. The problem is that it's not very flexible as the network changes. So when the network's running, people are sending data, the delay, delay may change, the data or the throughput may change across links therefore there may be better routes between a source destination pair. With fixed routing we don't consider that. It's very inflexible in that sense. Suboptimal paths will be used on a regular basis. So with fixed routing, determine the paths, determine the routes using some algorithm and then somehow program it into the nodes so that when we send data we will use those paths. Let's focus on how we do that, how we store the information about the paths. Uh, first, here's our network again, same network, just smaller. How many paths are there? How many least cost paths do we have in that network? In this network?
Any answer? Uh, uh, sorry, from... So here's our network, what we need to do, because we may want to be able to send data from anywhere, any node to any other node. Six wants to send data to three, then we need a path. Four wants to send to two, we need a path. So what we do when we build our network, we find all least cost paths from any source to any destination, or from any source to every destination. So how many paths would there be in that case? Well, we have six potential sources, node one through to node six are sources. Node one, how many potential destinations? Five, five other nodes. So there's five paths needed. Node two, how many potential destinations? Five, there are five de destinations. Remember, from one to two, and from two to one, they may be different paths because there's different costs. There may be different least cost paths. So from two to all other destinations, there's five paths needed. From three to five others, so there are 30 paths needed in total. With six nodes, there are 30 possible paths from any source to any destination. Each six to five possible destinations. So we calculate the 30 paths. And right, we'd use an algorithm to calculate them for us. And you've got this at, towards the end of this lecture, no, uh, yeah, the, this topic. I've calculated the paths for, for each of those source nodes. So this table on the left, ignore the one on the right, that's, that's later, this one. I've calculated the paths from uh, each node to each possible destination. So the first source node one. If one is the source, then in fact my program that did this calculates from node one to the six other nodes, node one to one, one to two, one to three and so on. We don't consider the case from node one to node one. We don't care about that, sending to ourselves. Ignore this first row. The second row here is destination node two, third row destination row three, uh, node three, four, five, six. And this is if node two is the source, destination node one, three, four, five, six, and so on for the other nodes. That's what this table shows. So I've calculated the paths, and we can read it as from node one to node two, the path is one direct to two. From node one to node six, the a least cost path is one, four, five, six, and the cost of that path is four. From node three to node four, a least cost path is three, five, four, and the cost is two. Okay. And there are 30 paths listed there for each, in total for the network. The costs with zero are, are not paths at all, they are direct to, from source to destination. That's for our, thir our six node network. What if you have a hundred nodes? How many paths? Okay, just a, a larger network, 100 nodes. How many paths do we need? With six nodes, how many do we need? We needed 30. So with 100, we need how many? How many sources are there with 100 nodes? Nine thousand nine hundred paths. With six nodes, remember, we need to path from any node to any other node. So there are six possible sources. Each source has five possible destinations. So six times five paths, thirty paths. With one hundred nodes, there are one hundred possible sources. Each source has ninety-nine possible destinations. So ninety-nine times one hundred, nine thousand nine hundred paths needed. That's when you need a computer to calculate those paths for you because you're not going to cal calculate that 10,000 paths by hand. But you do the same thing. Calculate the least cost paths. Let's look at some of the paths. 
look at some concepts of how do we store the paths. Let's just make, make note of some paths. If we look at the table on the other slide, a path, a least cost path from 1 to 6 we had was 1, 4, 5, 6. And the cost was 4 units in that case. Uh, so that's, we've calculated that. What's the least cost path from 4 to 6? Don't look at the picture. Don't cheat. Don't look at the picture. Look at the screen. What's the least cost path from 4 to 6? The hint is it's up here. It must be, or a least cost path from 4 to 6, must be 4, 5, 6. There may be others, but there should be no other paths with a lower cost from 4 to 6. That's an important point. And you can check now, if you want to check, it, it turns out it is in our network. There's a path 4, 5, 6, and it has a cost of 3. And if you check, the segment from 1 to 4 has a cost of 1, and from 4 to 6 has a cost of 3. So the path from 1 to 6 had a cost of 4. If we look at the individual segments, 1 to 4 had a cost of 1, 4 to 6 a cost of 3. Because the least cost path from 1 to 6 includes the segment 4, 5, 6, it implies that a least cost path from 4 to 6 must include 4, 5, 6. Why? Well, what if it didn't? What if there was a path from 4 to 6 with a cost of 2? Let's say we had another node, node 7. There was a path 4, 7, 6, and it had a cost of 2. Then look at the first path. What can we say about that? If there's a path 476, so there's a new node in the network connected between four, in between 4 and 6, has a cost of 2 units. What does that tell us about the first path? Or Tell me a, path, a least cost path from 1 to 6. Then there must be a path from 1 to 6, which is 1, 4, 7, 6, which would have a cost of 1. To get from 1 to 4, the cost is 1. But now we say to get from 4 to 6, the cost is 2. Therefore, there must be a path from 1 to 6, 1, 4, 7, 6, with a cost of 3 which is lower than our current cost of 4. So if there existed a path from 4 to 6 with a lower cost than 4, 5, 6, then it must mean that there's a path from 1 to 6 with a lower cost than 1, 4, 5, 6. Of course, there is no, no node 7 in our network, so it's not the case, but it try to give an example of the fact that if we know this is a least cost path, 1, 4, 5, 6, then it directly leads to a least cost path 4, 5, 6 being present from 4 to 6. Because if there was a lower cost path from 4 to 6, such as 4, 7, 6, with a cost of 2, then there would be a lower cost path from 1 to 6. But we just said this is the least cost path, so there cannot be a lower cost path. So, what we can learn from that is that 
given a least cost path, all the segments along there also make up least cost paths. There may be other least cost paths with the same cost, but there, there will not be any lower ones. So if we know 1, 4, 5, 6 is a least cost path, we know 1, 4 is a least cost path, 4, 5, from 4 to 5, from 5 to 6, and we know 4 to 6, the least cost path is 4, 5, 6, 1 to 5, we know a least cost path is 1, 4, 5. The segments are also least cost paths. That's useful because it means that we don't need to store the entire path when we store the information about where to send data. And that helps in our structuring of routing tables. Any questions on that concept? That's important to know before we move on. Do people see why that's the case or see why it can't be the case that we have a lower cost path from four to six? The logic of that makes sense? Okay? You sure? There'll be questions in the quiz for you uh, tomorrow afternoon to make sure you're sure. Now, we use this information to work out where to, what information to store for our routes. <coughs> if, if node 1 has data to send to 6, then it wants that data to traverse the path 1, 4, 5, 6. So node 1 sends the data, think of a single packet, the destination is 6. Node 1 sends it to node 4 because that's the next node in the path. Node 4 sees it has some data, the destination is still 6, it came from 1, destination is 6. Node 4 doesn't need to know the path before there, in fact it doesn't need to even need to know the source. It just needs to know, okay, I've got data, destination is 6, the least cost path from me, node 4, to 6 is 4, 5, 6, so I send to 5. And let's just remove if you ignore that one another path we know which is least cost is 5, 6 which had a cost of you'll check, I think it was 2. because 4, 5, 6 is a least cost path, so is 5, 6. So what happens, node 1 has data to send to 6. It knows that the next node in the path to reach 6 is node 4, so we send the data to 4. Node 4 has the data, looks at the destination, destination 6. Node 4 knows from its least cost path to reach 6, the next node is node 5, so it sends to node 5. and Node 5 receives this data, sees the destination is 6, and Node 5 has a least cost path to 6, which is to send direct to 6. So 5 would send to 6, and 6 would receive the data and finish. The process that we use there, when Node 1 sends to Node 4, it in fact doesn't care that 5 is going to come after 4. All Node 1 needs to know is, what is the next node in the path to reach destination 6? Similar, all node 4 needs to know to reach destination 6, what is the next node in the path? Because of this nature that the segments are all least cost paths of the entire path, then we know if we send to node 4, we don't need to tell node 4 to send to 5 and 6, because if node 4 has data and is going to send a 6, then it's guaranteed to travel a least cost path. So what we actually need to know from the sender's perspective is what is the next node in the least cost path? For example, 
node 1 needs to know that the next node to reach node 6 is 4. Node 4 needs to know the next node to reach node 6 is 5. And 5 needs to know that 6 is the next node. We don't need to know the rest, or we don't need to store the rest of the path. And that becomes important in practice. and ar arrives at how routing tables are normally structured. So again, what we do now is calculate all least cost paths in the network. So we know the least cost paths from every source to every destination. <coughs> Similar to this table, we calculate this entire table. We have all the paths, 1, 2, 1, 4, 5, 3, 1, 4 and so on. <clears throat> then we store in some table, a routing table, instead of the entire path, we store only the next node in the path to reach some destination. And optionally we store the cost. In practice we may use the cost as well. So we store information which is to reach this destination, the next node in the least cost path is this node. And optionally the cost of that is some cost. This is the general structure of a routing table or a routing directory. We normally call it a routing table. So we calculate all the least cost routes, but then we just store the next node, which is in fact the second column in this picture. From node 1, its routing table would be this set of data, but just Destination, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Next node, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. The other part of information is not needed. We may store the cost as well. Node 2. From node 2 to nodes 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6, the next nodes are 1, 3, 4, 4, and 4. Because node 2, if we're sending to 6, we just need to know to send to 4, and then 4 will use its least cost path to send to 6. And the least cost path from 4 to 6 will, is included in the least cost path from 2 to 6. What we get, and we'll come back to the one we missed, are routing tables that look like this. They're called directories here, but uh, that's just from the textbook. A routing table. These are the routing tables for individual nodes. How to read them is, if we have data at node 1, and the destination is node 2, send to node 2. If we have data at node 4, so we have a packet at node 4, and the destination of that packet is node 3, send to node 5. So these are routing tables for each of the nodes. And in this is the case where each node stores its own routing table. Where does that data come from? You can check. Look at node 1. To reach destinations 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, the next nodes are 2, 4, 4, 4 and 4. From node 1 to reach the destinations 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, the next nodes are 2, 4, 4, 4 and 4. So that routing table information, destination next node, is directly from the, sh the least cost path calculations. But we don't need to store the entire path, we just store the next node in the path. Why is that an advantage? A, storing an entire path uses up memory, okay, especially when we have long paths. And importantly, when we exchange information with other nodes, then we only need to exchange the next node. We don't have to tell them about the entire path. We don't need to determine the entire path in some cases. So it simplifies routing in large networks uh, by just keeping track of the next node.
this is a case where we distribute the routing tables amongst each node. Node 4 has data to send to 6. Normally in the packet that contains the data, there's a header. Inside the header will be the destination address. Destination equals 6. So what node 4... Sorry, let's go back to our simple case. Node 1 has data to send to 6. Destination 6. Node 1... Destination 6, it looks in its routing table. Destination 6, OK, let's send this packet to node 4. The packet's delivered across the link to node 4. Node 4 receives the packet. The destination is still node 6. Node 4 looks in its routing table. Destination 6, let's send to 5. 5 receives the packet. Destination is still node 6. 5 looks in the routing table. Destination 6, let's send to 6. 6 receives the packet. 6 is the destination. We've successfully delivered the data from 1 to 6. That process of using the routing tables to determine where to send the data is called forwarding. We forward the data from node to node by looking up the routing tables. The process of forwarding. So we often separate the two processes. Routing are the strategies, protocols and algorithms for finding the least cost paths and creating the routing table. So putting the data inside those routing tables is the role usually of a routing protocol. So calculate or collect the information about the network, calculate the least cost paths and then store it at a routing table. That's routing or the process, the procedure for a routing protocol. Forwarding is the process of, okay, once we have those routing tables and I have data to send from source to destination, simply look in the routing tables to determine who to send it to, who to forward the data to until it reaches the destination. So we usually separate out those systems. And for example, in the internet, the protocol used for forwarding is called the internet protocol, IP. There are different protocols used for routing. So there are separate processes, separate protocols. But both of them are centered around the routing table. Routing creates the routing table, puts data into the routing table. Forwarding uses or reads the routing table. We saw an example. This example is when we store the routing information in the nodes themselves. Another approach is if we have some central node that stores all the routes, a centralized routing table, like this. So we store in some special node from source node 3 to reach node 2, send to node 5. From node 5 to reach node 2, send to node 4. From 4 to reach node 2, send to node 2. And you note that, look at the columns, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. It's just a combination of each of these columns. So it's just a combined information, it's exactly the same information presented in a different way. Centralised routing table used in a small network is usually when we have one special node that can keep track of the routes and store this. In larger networks, distributed routing tables, where the same information is stored but split amongst the different nodes uh, is used in this case. And that's what's used in the internet, distributed routing tables. Let's have a look at one example. A very quick example, we'll see another one later, maybe, see if it works. So in the internet, our, no our uh, routing tables are distributed amongst the nodes in the internet. And in practice, amongst all computers or all devices that use the internet protocol. Uh, so on my laptop, let's try and look at the routing table. 
So my laptop, when it's connected to the internet, it has a routing table. Now it's very simple. Uh, and we won't go through the details because we haven't studied addresses and parts of the internet protocol. But we'll see the basic structure. It's a table. There are, there's the header row and there's th three rows of data. Okay? So three routes in this case. And focus on the first two columns. The first column is the destination. The next second column title gateway is the next node in the route. So if we want to equate this, so destination is our destination, gateway is our next node. Destination, instead of next node, it's called gateway. It's just another name. The ne next node in the, in the path. Of course, in the internet, we don't use numbers to identify computers. Well, uh, we don't use small numbers like this. We use larger numbers, uh, and they're presented in different ways. So. We'll see some examples here. In fact, we've used some names to map the, the IP addresses to names. Uh, let's simplify that. Just look at the second case. Same information presented in a different way. Three routes for my computer. Skip over the first one for now. The second two are saying, in fact, in the internet, we don't necessarily have to store routes to individual nodes we can store routes to an entire network of nodes. And that's what the second two rows are. They're saying, to reach anyone on this network, anyone starting with address 169254, then send to this de destination. All zeros. Well, this is a special case. This says, in fact, don't send to an X1, you can send direct to them. There's no router that you need to send to, no next node to send to. You can send it across your link to that node. Now, this is not the best example because we haven't covered these concepts of networks yet. But these two are saying if anyone is on these networks, in the third one, 192.168.1.0, don't send to another switch, send direct to that destination. That's what the gateway of all zeros means. The first one says, for anyone else, anyone else in the world, that's what this all zeros case means here, it means if the destination is not one of these two, then send to the next node called 192.168.1.1. Again, in the internet, we can simplify routing tables by instead of storing routes to every possible destination, we can <coughs> use these concepts like a default route. If I want to reach someone starting with 169.254 or 192.168.1, send direct to them. Otherwise, the first one says, send everything else to 192.168.1.1. So this is actually my local router in the network. We will come back and see examples and, and the exact meanings of those addresses in the topic on, on internet working, on the IP. On IP. Any questions on routing tables? What you should be able to do, uh, and you'll see in the quiz, for example, given some simple network topology, find some least cost routes. So go through the steps. I think you'll see a quiz question. Here's a network topology. Tell me the routing table for node 3. So how do you do that? What you do is from the network topology, you calculate the least cost paths. You don't necessarily need all of them. In the questions, at least, you won't need to calculate all least cost paths. It won't be too complex. Calculate the least cost paths. And then to create the routing table, look at those paths. And for each destination, find the next node in the least cost path to reach that destination. And that creates your routing table. The routing table in the simplest form is two columns. Destination, next node in the path. Optionally, a third column of the cost, but that's not needed. So you get to practice and make sure that you can A, understand least cost paths, and B, how a routing table is constructed.
let's summarise on fixed routing. Uh, there's another routing strat strategy of flooding. We'll skip and do that tomorrow and then look at the dynamic or adaptive routing. So, fixed routing. We calculate or determine the routes when we build the network at network startup. We can use either a centralised or distributed approach for storing the routing table and choosing uh, the, the path, choosing the route. So which nodes choose the route. Because we know the entire network topology when we build the network, where does the information come from to calculate the least cost paths? Well, we say from all nodes. It's an approach where it's as if we have the entire picture of the network to, to calculate the least cost paths. But we never update that information. So I have an entire picture of the network at the start, calculate least cost paths, and that's it. Don't update the, the least cost paths. Well, in practice, we may do it on an irregular basis, like every few months or, or when a major change happens. Because it's never updated, it means then often we may be using suboptimal paths, paths which are not actually the least cost means it's only really useful when we have small networks or, or very stable networks. So um, when things don't change much, that's okay. But if things change often, the amount of data being sent changes, the delay changes, then we need to be more flexible than fixed routing. So what do we do to overcome that for large networks? Then we use the same approach but simply get regular updates. Maybe every few minutes, get an update by sending special packets through the network telling every other node about their current network conditions, the current link conditions. Like we saw in our example, all nodes send a special packet to every other node saying, this is my current, these are my current links, these are the current costs. As the nodes receive these special packets, they can recalculate the least cost paths. That's not fixed routing. That's the general approach of adaptive routing. We adapt. So we still use routing tables. We still calculate least cost routes. It's just that we do it on a regular basis. We continue doing it as the network operates. And it's what's used in most uh, medium to large sized networks, packet switching networks. And it's what's used in the internet today. we need to go through, well, well, for that to work, we need to get these regular updates about the current status of the links. So there are different ways to collect that information. We'll, we'll come back to that, but let's just summarise, well, how do we compare it? Uh, the advantage that we get from adaptive routing compared to fixed routing is that we get better performance because we more often choose the best path. So if we're always using the best path, we get the best performance. With fixed routing, if we use a, a suboptimal path for two weeks, then that could be poor performance. And we can do things like balance the amount of traffic. Traffic means the amount of data sent across the network. That is, I'm sending data across this path we detect that there's a lot of congestion there. A lot of people are sending across this path. So we start using an alternate path so that the data travelling through the network starts to be balanced. So instead of all the data going in one direction or across one portion of the network, we can spread it out. With fixed routing, that, that's not so easy. So it's much better for performance, but it comes at the expense of complexity. We need to continuously recalculate the least cost paths and we need to have algorithms to do that and to collect the information. And there's a lot of overhead if we collect a lot of information on a regular basis. The more information we collect, the better quality of that information and the better paths we'll choose, but the more overhead. So we'll see that there are trade-offs there. What we'll do tomorrow is go through this other strategy that we, we skipped over, flooding, which is completely different from the other, from fixed and adaptive routing. Flooding is just send to everyone. 
If you send to everyone, then eventually the destination will receive a copy and you don't need to calculate least cost paths. So let's go through flooding tomorrow and uh, finish on routing hopefully tomorrow. <coughs>